Welcome to Acute Neurological Nursing for NUR210. This preparatory lecture is more of a review of pathophysiology related to the brain and the abnormalities that can occur. Hopefully this will help prepare you to discuss the abnormalities in class and to complete your pre-class assignments. Your brain is very complicated and it has an incredible ability to compensate for changes, but those compensatory mechanisms last but a short period of time. Before we talk about that, let's review some things from anatomy and physiology. Your brain does not have the ability to store glucose as other parts of your body can, so it relies heavily on adequate perfusion, or blood flow, to get the oxygen and glucose to the brain cells necessary to make ATP for cell health. Without either of them, cell death can occur very rapidly. You can see by this picture that your brain alone requires about 15 to 20 percent of the total cardiac output to maintain its needs for adequate energy production. It also uses up approximately 25 percent of the total body glucose supply. To help control the amount of blood going to the brain, there is something known as autoregulation. Autoregulation occurs in many arterial vessels throughout your body not just in the brain. If your kidneys are not getting enough blood flow, the size of the arterioles are going to change to allow more blood in. They will vasodilate prior to the glomeruli. If your leg has a sudden clot in the arterial system, the vessels distal to the clot will dilate in an effort to get more blood flow to that now ischemic leg. The brain works very much the same way. It likes blood flow for the obvious reason but can't accommodate too much due to the tight space. And not too little, but it wants it just right to meet its energy needs. If the systemic blood pressure going through the carotid arteries is too high, the vessels will vasoconstrict to reduce the blood flow and maintain a normal perfusion pressure. If the systemic blood pressure decreases through the carotid arteries, the vessels will dilate to increase perfusion to the brain. This is autoregulation. This ability to maintain normal perfusion pressures works great if the systolic blood pressure stays within 50 to 160 millimeters of mercury. But if the systemic blood pressure falls outside of those parameters, autoregulation fails and the body relies solely on the systemic blood pressure alone to maintain perfusion pressures. There is no vasodilation or vasoconstriction of the vessels at that time. This will make more sense later when talking about increased intracranial pressure and how the body attempts to compensate. To expand on that last concept a bit, there are three components that take up space normally within the skull. Brain tissue that takes up about 80% of the total volume, cerebral spinal fluid or CSF, that takes up about 10% and blood, venous and arterial that takes up the remaining 10% of the total volume. If any one of these volumes change, the, the hypothesis states that the other two will need to change their volume to maintain normal intracranial pressures within that tight cranial vault as that space cannot expand. That usually begins with CSF displacing itself or there is an alteration in venous flow. In very small children, the fontanelles are still open, so there is some room for expansion, but not in adults. Add now, on top of that, a big tumor, or lots of swelling due to trauma, and there is not a lot that can be done to keep the ICP within normal ranges and the pressures rise. Now, let's talk about another factor that controls blood flow to the brain and that is the role that carbon dioxide plays in arterial vessel size. Carbon dioxide is a potent vasodilator. In a patient with head trauma, for instance, who is developing massive swelling due to the primary injury, the last thing we want is for that carbon dioxide level to climb as vasodilation will occur and more blood will be going into the brain. There's too much stuff trying to squeeze into that tight space and ICP will rise. Therefore, many patients with severe head trauma will require mechanical ventilation so we can control the blood level of carbon dioxide 
ideally at low normal levels around 35 millimeters of mercury. Now we put the patient on a ventilator and aggressively hyperventilate them prior to suctioning, say. What happens with the carbon dioxide level? Well, if we're aggressively hyperventilating them to suction them, then it's going to go down below 35 millimeters of mercury due to blowing off too much CO2 and vasoconstriction will occur. Now there's not enough perfusion to the brain. It is definitely a delicate balance and one that nurses need to keep a very keen eye on. So just to reiterate then, in caring for these patients with increased ICP, one of the many goals is to keep their blood carbon dioxide level at low normal, typically between 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury on a blood gas. This is accomplished through adjustments of the ventilator rate and or tidal volume. Because we don't want to constantly draw labs to closely monitor the carbon dioxide level, the nurse will utilize an end tidal carbon dioxide monitor so the level can be tracked continuously. If there is a sudden rise in ICP, orders may be given to hyperventilate the patient to cause temporary vasoconstriction until other treatment modalities are ordered, such as a stat dose of mannitol. You may be wondering at this point how intracranial pressure is actually measured and monitored. This picture shows you the many ways this can be achieved. One of these measurement tools will be connected to a monitor where the pressure will be continuously trended. If the patient has increased ICP due to hydrocephalus, they will likely have a ventriculostomy where the healthcare provider may decide to drain off some CSF to control the pressures. This catheter can also be connected to a monitor to track the intracranial pressures. Depending on the book that you read, normal ICPs range anywhere from 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Normally, everyday activities can cause an increase in ICP, but it's transitory. So some reasons for transitory increases in ICP include straining, such as with passing gas or attempting to have a bowel movement, sneezing, coughing, and that includes while being suctioned, having PEEP set on the ventilator. If the intrathoracic pressures are higher due to PEEP, it will be more difficult to drain venous blood from the brain back into the right atrium. Supine positions with the head of the bed flat or in Trendelenburg. Neck flexion or rotation, as again, this will prevent venous drainage from the brain as well as CSF. Having a decreased oxygen level, for whatever reason, is truly a catastrophic event for a patient with increased ICP. As remember, the brain relies heavily on glucose and oxygen delivery to produce ATP. The pressure will suddenly rise in the face of hypoxia, and it needs to be prevented at all costs. You can guess at this point, then, that some of our treatment modalities for patients with increased ICP such as keeping the head of the bed elevated and keeping the head midline, for example, are our goals. What intracranial pressure then are we most concerned with? It is, it is a sustained ICP of 20 millimeters or greater. That is considered intracranial hypertension and it is a bad sign. In a patient who is having their ICP trended, we as nurses can add another set of vital signs. It is known as the cerebral perfusion pressure, or CPP. Essentially, it is measuring the force of the blood entering the brain through calculating the mean arterial pressure, or MAP, versus the opposing pressure within the brain itself, which is the intracranial pressure. In order for you to determine the CPP, you would need to calculate the mean arterial pressure using the systolic and diastolic blood pressures and subtracting the provided ICP measurement. Again, depending on the textbook or article you are reading, a completely normal CPP in a patient without increased intracranial pressure is between 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. In a patient with increased ICP, the hope is that through treatment interventions, the CPP can remain at approximately 65 millimeters of mercury. 
anything less than 50 millimeters of mercury will lead to a loss of autoregulation and will result in cerebral tissue hypoxia. When the ICP equals the MAP, brain death usually results. I will talk about that in a bit. So let's practice calculating one. The patient has a blood pressure of 110 over 74 millimeters of mercury. First calculate your mean and stop my video for just a minute to get that number. The MAP for this patient is 86 millimeters of mercury. The provided ICP measurement via a monitor is 24 millimeters of mercury. What, that, what then is the cerebral perfusion pressure? Pause the video and hand calculate it before you proceed. This patient's CPP then is 86 minus 24. And you should have gotten the answer of 62 millimeters of mercury. I don't know about you, but I am not comfortable with this number. In looking at this picture, and you may want to pause it, you can see the cascade of events that transpire when there is trauma to the brain. It does not take long for serious consequences to occur with untreated increased intracranial pressure. Just to reiterate, we don't get too anxious about transitory increases in intracranial pressure, but any sustained ICP at 20 millimeters of mercury or greater should create concern. Why is that? Well, as we discussed earlier, there is just so much stuff that can cram inside that tight skull before the pressure needs to be relieved. And what will happen with untreated or rapid increases in ICP is what we call herniation. It occurs usually in one of three places and basically means that brain tissue finds its escape valve and is displaced downward where it certainly doesn't belong. There is no surgery in the world that can allow a neurosurgeon to enter the brain and push it back into its original place. Once herniation occurs, the patient is declared brain dead. An astute nurse will be able to predict exactly when herniation will occur if immediate interventions either are not taken or don't work, as there are very definitive signs and symptoms exhibited by the patient that indicate the last ditch attempt at compensation is occurring in an effort to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. This happens when the MAP is close to equaling the ICP. These signs and symptoms are very late signs of increased intracranial pressure and are known as Cushing's triad. Autoregulation at this point is not working, so the brain is relying solely on the systolic blood pressure to drive more blood into the brain. But you can imagine there is already too much stuff up there, so the potential for that to work is pretty null at this point. The first component then is increased systolic blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure will go up without a concurrent rise in the diastolic blood pressure and therefore this creates a widened pulse pressure. The definition of pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressures with normal values being between 40 and 60 millimeters of mercury. So if your blood pressure is 120 over 80 then your pulse pressure is 40 millimeters of mercury. These gaps are pretty evident as you may see pulse pressures close to 100 millimeters of mercury. The last thing you will see is bradycardia. The baroreceptors located in your carotid arteries and your aortic arch sense a sudden rise in the systolic blood pressure and they don't like it. They will stimulate the vagus nerve in an effort to reduce the sudden hypertensive episode causing bradycardia. As ICP rises, the respiratory patterns change, also giving the nurse a clue if the patient is not intubated that things are pretty much going downhill. With early increases in intracranial pressure, the nurse may note chain stokes respirations, where periods of hyperventilation at increasing depths, then decreasing depths or tidal volumes, are followed by periods of apnea. This is pretty interesting to watch. As ICP continues to rise, central neurogenic hyper hyperventilation occurs where respirations become very fast and deep. The problem with this one 
is that remember hyperventilation will blow off carbon dioxide and lowering levels of carbon dioxide causes cerebral vessel vasoconstriction. So that's not desirable. So this is where the patient may need to be paralyzed and sedated after intubation so the healthcare team can better manage the intracranial pressure. Continued increases in ICP will result in respiratory patterns that are typically not compatible with life. I think this is a good place to end the pathophysiology piece of this module. With the pre-assignment and our discussion in class, I will delve more into signs and symptoms, specific injuries that result in increased ICP, and treatment modalities. If you have any questions on this presentation, please don't hesitate to bring them with you to class. Have a great day.